Um, I'm, I'm really honored to be here, and thank all, thanks to all of you for coming. As uh, Professor Dong said, I, I am a sociocultural anthropologist. Uh, and anthropology in that, as, as a discipline, means something different than philosophical anthropology means. I am going to talk about philosophical anthropology today, but in the beginning it's important to know that what, what sociocultural anthropologists are interested in is studying the ways different communities around the world live and what is the range of variation in the possibilities for human life. So rather than developing universal kinds of propositions, it's a discipline very devoted to the diversity of human ways of life, and that's its, its uh, rationale. Um, but over, over the last 20 years or so, there's been a large growth in anthropologists interested in studying ethics. Um, it is replaced in a sense, or not replaced, but it's in competition with a very strong focus on studying the role of power in social life. About 20 years ago, a group of anthropologists began to think that people don't always guide action by interest in power, much less interest in wealth. Their actions are also guided by ethical considerations. And anthropologists hadn't paid so much attention to that. So there's been a, it, it's probably maybe the fastest growing area in anthropology now is the anthropological study of, of ethics. And um, that has brought anthropology into serious conversation with philosophy in a way that it really hadn't been since maybe 1970 when there was a big debate, particularly in England, between analytic philosophers and anthropologists about the question of whether rationality was universal. Could you have different kinds of rationality in different, in different cultures? But that lasted five or 10 years and, and ended. And since then, anthropology and philosophy hadn't been in much conversation. But they have been very much more so over the last 10 years in, in particular. Um, and my own focus within the anthropology of ethics has been on the topic of values, which is what I'm going to talk about in these three lectures. I, I, um, and one of the things I, I'm not sure I'm going to argue it, but I'm going to assume it in these lectures, is that the anthropology of values cannot proceed without engaging some of the philosophical literature on values. The social scientific literature on values is relatively small and recent. The philosophical literature on values is very, very large and older. And so I think that anthropology, just as more other kinds of anthropologists of ethics turn to philosophy, so do anthropologists of values need to do that. So in these three lectures then, uh, over today, tomorrow, and Wednesday, I want to consider how philosophy and anthropology can be brought together to produce an approach to the study of values that can support anthropological theorizing and anthropological empirical research on the role of values in social and, uh, and, and personal life. Um, as I realized as early as yesterday, well, I realized by looking on the internet first, but then talked to Kian yesterday. I, I, um, a lot of the philosophy I'm interested in of values is German philosophy. And I'm, I've sort of walked into a trap here, as we say, because I know this department is very, very uh, excellent and sophisticated in German philosophy. So uh, I am sure I will make some mistakes with the philosophy, but I hope it will be interesting to see what a sociocultural anthropologist wants to do with that German, parts of that German philosophical tradition, and I hope that seeing that tradition from a, a different angle uh, will be worth uh, uh, allowing me to be a little bit naive in my treatment of philosophy uh, today. Okay, so that's my introduction, but now I, I want to start talking about uh, values. And, and uh, when we talk about values, we're talking about the evaluative aspect of social life. Okay, Humans don't just perceive the world, but in the very act of perceiving the world, 
they also understand some things to be better or more important than other things and some things to be worse or less important than other things. Drawing on my colleague James Laidlaw, who has written sort of the best overview of the anthropology of ethics, and I've been told it's been published in Chinese now. It's called The Subject of Virtue. Um, following something he, he said about, uh, about the anthropology of ethics in general, we might say that the studies of, val of values is important not because human beings always follow their values, but because human beings are evaluative animals. Human beings always evaluate the world. They don't just perceive it, they also try to determine whether it's good or bad. It also is true that uh, because human beings are evaluative creatures, uh, as the Polish philosopher Joseph Tischner puts it, our world, the human world, is a hierarchically ordered world and our thinking a preferential thinking. So that when we perceive the world, we also arrange things into hierarchies and we are immediately aware of preferring some things to other things. We rarely simply set things in the world side by side. You know, we rarely say, here's coffee and here's water. Instead, we want to check, well, which one is better and, and, and which one is higher? Which one is lower? This is a very deep human impulse everywhere in the world. So when we're talking about values, we're talking about that aspect of human life, the aspect that's always evaluating the world, not simply perceiving it. This is important for anthropology because some of the key differences between cultures follow from the differences in what they define as in some ways better or worse than other things. One of the easiest ways to introduce people to the, the reality of cultural differences to, is to talk about differences in things that people value. So for, for example, some societies think that elders are the most important people around. And some people think, some cultures define children as the most important people in the society. Some societies think meat is the most prestigious food. And some societies think vegetarian food is more prestigious or more important. Some societies highly value success in this world or in this life. And there are other societies that argue that the most more, and it's more important to live for, some, for success in some other world or life that will come in the future. Some societies value social stability. Uh, so, uh, others value individual achievement. Some value change some value keeping things the same. There's all kinds of different values. I mean, I, I'm just giving you um, some very basic examples just chosen to illustrate the point. Let me give you a straightforward example of the kind anthropologists like because it's often not very familiar to people, but a very famous case uh, where you can see a value, a kind of value in another culture that may look unusual from the point of view of your own as the newer of Southern Sudan, who were studied by one of the most important British anthropologists of the 20th century named Edward Evan Evans Pritchard. He's got a, uh, he, um, for, the, for the newer of Southern Sudan, cattle are one of the most important things in their lives, maybe even the most important. And newer perceive very fine distinctions between varieties of cattle. In fact, they have 12 different names, discrete words for cattle, based on the coloring and pattern of spots on the animal. And they know which of these 12 different kinds of cattle are better, they evaluate, and which of these kinds of uh, cattle are worse. And the fact that they have 12 different kinds of cattle, in their understanding, and that they're constantly ranking them in relation to each other tells us how important cattle are and how much better newer think cattle are than pretty much anything else a person can have. There's a, a that famous French phrase, if you want to know why there's a dispute, cherchez la femme, you know, look for the woman. If there's a dispute between men, look for the women. And Evans Pritchard said, if there's a dispute among the newer, cherchez la vache, look for the cattle. Look, I mean, if they're fighting, they're fighting over cattle. But you could also then go to where I did my field work in Papua New Guinea, which is uh, the world's uh, second largest island 
uh, and it, it's off the coast of Australia. And it has a fifth of the world's languages. There are 800 languages spoken by 4 million people in New Guinea at the time of, of contact. Um, and the Eratmen, as you can imagine, if there are 4 million people speaking 800 different languages, not dialects, the language groups are very small. And Eratmen is one of these. There's only 800, uh, I mean, yes, there's only 800 people. No, I'm sorry, there's only 400 people who speak Yoruban, the Yorup language. Um, so, and you'll hear more about the Yorupmen in later lectures. But for now, I just want to point out that pigs are the most highly valued possession amongst the Yorupmen. In fact, all Yorupmen houses are just one room. And the names of the walls in, the, in, in Yorupmen houses are front, back, pig side, and pig side. And as the Rotmans say, a good woman sleeps with her pigs on her skin, which means that good women sleep with piglets cuddled up on the sides of the houses while men sleep in the front and the back until the piglets are old enough to take care of themselves outside of the house. Now, in the UK, if you took your pigs into bed with you, the state would probably take your children away, right? You would be defined as a, as a bad parent because we don't value pigs that highly. We value them some, and a lot of people like the way they taste, but they aren't the most important things in our world. But in Yorotman, pigs are extremely highly valued. I could give you millions more examples of differences in the ways people in different societies value things that anthropologists have found in all of their research. And in talking about valuing things now, and I want to say this and then I'm going to just use the word things, I don't just mean physical objects or animals like a pig, I also mean states of affairs, types of behaviors, things can refer to anything that people evaluate, that they say, well, that's good or that's bad. Um, there are millions and millions and millions of things that people value differently across different cultures in the world. And I just wanted to give these few examples just to get us started at the kinds of differences uh, we can look at. Much of what makes the comparative anthropological project interesting then is not just differences in how people define or categorize or perceive things in their world, although these differences are, are interesting, but our differences in how they differentiate between things they recognize in terms of the relative value of those things. And how that differentiation between things that are very good, good, bad, very bad, etc., how those shape the, the ways that people live their lives. Okay, now these issues I've just raised are in some sense very introductory to what will follow today and then in the other two lectures. And, and particularly after today, we're gonna look at different ways values can be organized in relation to one another and the effects different types of organization of values have on ethical life in particular. So one of the things I'm gonna to argue to you is that values can be arranged in different ways in any given society and that the ways they're arranged have a very strong effect on what ethical life looks like in those societies. In particular, I'm gonna talk about monist organizations of values and pluralist organizations of values to adopt terms from philosophy of value and say that they lead to very different experiences of moral life for people. That's the second lecture. And then in the third lecture, I wanna look now not at values of things like pigs and, and, uh, and cattle, but at what uh, the anthropologist Charles Taylor calls high-level values, the kinds of values that organize all the other values in, in a society. And I want to look at what the range of those kind of values are that anthropologists have found can organize viable societies, societies that can reproduce themselves. I think anthropologists will argue to you, and I'll argue on at the conference, that there's more than one kind of high-level value that can create a viable society. And in the third lecture, we'll look at that. But what I want to do today is ask some more elementary questions about, well, what do we mean when we talk about value? Why do humans need values at all? 
And then finally, where are values in the world? Are they just inside of people, or are they real things in the world? So I'm going to go in that order, and I'm going to start by defining values. Um, I, there is no completely accepted definition of values, as far as I can tell, in philosophy, and certainly not in social science. But I'm going to adopt a classic anthropological definition of values. This is a definition that was given by Clyde Cluckone, who himself is largely forgotten, but was a colleague of Talcott Parsons, who's a very famous sociologist. Anyway, the, the point is he trained many of the most important American anthropologists at Harvard in this unique school of, of social relations, not anthropology, sociology, economics, psychology, but all of them. Uh, anyway, uh, Cluckhone offered a, a definition of, of values that sounds like this. He says, values are what are desirable. Not necessarily what is desired. And I know I'm making a, a complicated distinction in English here. So if, if there's a Chinese equivalent and somebody wants to offer it, that would be fine. But it, it, what, what values are is what's desirable, but not necessarily what is desired. As Cluckholm put it, a value is a conception of the desirable, which influences the selection from available modes, means, and ends of action. But what I want to focus on here is just the word desirable and the way that it's not the same as to be desirable is not the same as to be desired. The argument of Cluckhone, and he's not the only person to make this kind of argument, of course, is that we all have all kinds of desires. But values are the desires that we think or feel or just know that we should have. The desirable are desires we feel we should have, even though we have many other desires that are also strong in us, but not that we feel we should have. One way to put this uh, is that values are second order desires. They're desires about what we should desire. They help us decide which among the many desires we have, we should pay attention to and try to realize. So you're in this lecture now. You might have a very strong desire to look at your cell phone, or maybe even to fall asleep, or to leave, or anything like that. Um, but you know that what you should want to do in this context is listen to the person lecturing. right? That's what's desirable. It may not be what you exactly desire, but it is what is desirable. The desire in this, the, the, the value in this situation is something like gaining knowledge or wanting to look like you want to gain knowledge to some of your colleagues who are here with you. And both of those values can be realized by listening to the person lecturing. So listening is what it is right to desire in this situation. Not necessarily the desire you have, but it's the desire that is desirable in this situation. Um, values then are things that we know in a second order kind of way, right? We have all these desires and then we have a second order desire that tells us these are the right things to desire. Um, uh, uh, desires, uh, values then are things we know in the second kind, order kind of way are right to desire, okay? That's what desirable is. Another way to think about this that gets closer to social science is things that are desirable are also the things you feel you could explain to somebody else in your social world why you desire. Do you know what I mean? Like if you really did check your cell phone and somebody said, well, why did you check your cell phone? And you said, well, I'm waiting for a text from my friend or something, you'd kind of know that's not a good answer. Right? Whereas if somebody said, well, why did you sit and, and listen quietly to the person lecturing, you would say, well, because I wanted to hear what they had to say. And, and you would know that that was a socially acceptable thing to want, to desire in that situation. Okay. Um, so to this classical definition of anthropological definition of values as things that are desirable, not just desired, but desirable, I, I want to add one point that 
is implicit in the definition, but that I think will be critical in the next two lectures and is good to keep track of, which is that values always hierarchize the relations between things in the world. Okay? To define something or state of affairs or quality of a person, etc., is as desirable as to define other things, states of affairs, qualities of a person, etc., as less desirable or as not desirable at all. So to define listening quietly to the lecture as desirable is to define looking at your cell phone as not desirable. You see what I'm saying? Okay. At the same time that values hierarchize the relations between things in the world, they also hierarchize the relations between themselves. And I'm not going to talk about this very much until the second lecture, but values are also hierarchized in relation to each other such that value A could be higher or lower than value B. The value of wanting to learn about what anthropologists think about ethics might be, say, higher than the value of seeing what your friend just texted, but might be lower than learning what Kant said about ethics, right? So if there was a lecture right now on Kantian ethics and there was this lecture on anthropology, maybe the higher value would be to go. So values are constantly hierarchized between themselves as well as hierarchizing the things in the world. That means, and this is the point I want to keep but then put aside till next lecture, that there's never only a single value in a society, right? Values depend on hierarchical relations with other values for their meaning, for their sense. You'll never find a situation where there's only one value because values are always comparing things. So there's always more than one. Okay, so that's the, value, the definition of values I'm going to work with, okay? As things that are desirable and that have this quality of hierarchizing things in the world, including themselves. I want to turn to another opening question now, first day kind of question, which is why do human beings need values? Right? Why do human beings need values at all? And I'm going to answer this by turning not to sociocultural anthropology, which I've talked about, the study of differences in human cultures, but to a discipline that's not really the largest discipline in philosophy, but that's called philosophical anthropology. Okay, and philosophical anthropology in general means a philosophical view of what human beings most fundamentally are. A field called philosophical anthropology had a very brief period of popularity in German philosophy from the 1920s to the 1940s, a, a period that the German intellectual history scholar Jerome Carroll calls the period of classical philosophical anthropology. And the key figures here were um, Max Scheler, who was a student of Husserl, uh, Helmuth Plessner, and Arnold Galen. Okay. After Galen, who was the youngest, the field somewhat faded away, and it hasn't had a huge legacy in philosophy, and it's not that well known today. I mean, it's there, and you can find it, particularly in German language. You know, there are Germans who do the history of this period and things. Part of the problem was that uh, Scheler died very young. Scheler was very famous in his time. He was Heidegger's real uh, competitor, as I understand it, to be sort of the most creative inheritor of uh, the Husserlian tradition. Uh, and Heidegger put a lot of energy into criticizing him and uh, making sure that he did not win that competition. And Shaler didn't help himself by dying very young, uh, but produced a tremendous amount of work. Even by the 30s, all of his work was translated into English. I don't know if it's been translated into Chinese. But he was a major figure, uh, but who sort of got pushed to the side. Galen and Plesner were were contemporaries. Uh, Galen was a strong anti-Nazi and, no, Plessner was a strong anti-Nazi and Galen was a Nazi and so they didn't, they wouldn't cooperate with each other at all. <laughs> so that fragmented the field and I kind of think that Galen 
who might have been the most interesting philosophical anthropologist was sort of set aside for that reason. So for instance, his work was published in English, but it's all out of print. Plessner has just started to come back. He's being retranslated in English and things. Anyway, but the big point is that you may never have heard of philosophical anthropology. If, if you haven't, that's, uh, you're not alone. It, it sort of faded from the scene. But taking some liberties with the differences between Shaler, Plessner, and Galen, I think they can all be said to have argued that human beings are fundamentally beings that aren't anything specific at all. That was their great insight, that the basic nature of human beings was that they don't exactly have a nature, or it is their nature, they have a nature, but their nature is to not have a nature, okay? What they all had in mind was the well-known fact uh, that human beings, especially compared to other animals and either, even other mammals, are born early, very early in their physical and mental development, and they're thus born helpless, and as it were, sort of empty. They're not at all equipped to survive in the world without a huge amount of help from other older human beings. Any of you who have ever been children or had children will know this, yeah? So this contrasts, the philosophical anthropologists tell us, with the situation of animals who are born with instincts that tell them what they need and how to go about getting that, what they need. And these instincts govern their perceptions of the world, behavior, and relations to one another. So in a sense, they are programmed to live in very specific worlds that are given to them by their biology. Humans, in contrast, don't have much in the way of instincts of this kind. They do have drives, like, you know, human babies can feel hunger, they can feel tired, they can have drives, but they don't have any instincts to tell them what would satisfy these drives and how to go about the task of addressing them, okay? So human individuals need help then from outside of themselves to develop an understanding of what they want or need and then how to get these things and also how to relate to one another. The three main philosophical anthropologists I've mentioned, Shaler, Plessner, and Galen, had different ways of referring to this quality of human beings as being kind of born empty or, or whose nature was not to have a defined nature. So Shaler, who had a, a very positive way of framing this, referred to what he called human world openness, okay? Humans can learn to perceive and take an interest in many, many different parts of the world. They can satisfy hunger, for example, with meat pies if they're British, or tree grubs if they're Eurotman, or any of millions of other kinds of food. As babies, then, humans are open to the world and can go in any of these directions and many more. Unlike animals who are built to perceive and approach the world in an, in, in a, in an instinctively given way, humans are open to the whole world and, and, and can approach it in a lot of different ways. Plessner has the most neutral formulation of this, so Shaler quite positively calls it human, uh, uh, world openness. Plessner uh, calls it the eccentric positionality of human beings. They sort of are not in the center of their world because they don't have instincts to center them. They stand to the side of it and have to kind of pick and choose. And, but Galen had the most negative sounding framing, but also I think the most influential framing of this quality of humans because he called humans deficient creatures or in the phrasing that became more uh, most important, he called them incomplete animals. That's really the key, that humans are born as incomplete animals. At birth, they're missing some crucial instinctive drives or desires and behavior patterns that would tell them how to live and flourish. So they're actually, as Galen puts it, missing something, okay? Now, as I noted, philosophical anthropology was not really all that successful in philosophy. Um, and under its own, na own name, called, being called philosophical anthropology, it also didn't become very well known in social science. However, 
through the work of two of the most influential social scientists of the second half of the 20th century, Galen's formulation of human beings as incomplete animals, that formulation in particular, quietly became absolutely fundamental to social scientific theorizing and research. Okay? One of these two social scientists was the hugely important sociologist Peter Berger. Has, has anybody heard of him? Yeah. Who, in 1965, published an article on Arnold Galen's idea of humans as incomplete animals, just at the same time he was finishing his, his really massively influential book called The Social Construction of Reality. And he coined this phrase that went on. You know, I think the three most significant social science words that social science or phrases social scientists made up in the 20th century were culture, gender, and the social construction of reality. So Peter Berger was talking about Galen's notion of human beings as sort of born empty, as incomplete animals at the same time he was developing this notion of the social construction of reality. And it's crucial to note that the human construction of reality for Berger is social precisely because it's not given biologically. It's not given by instinct. It's nothing an individual could do by themselves. Human individuals are all, when they're born, deficient. They can't make a world on their own based on their instincts. They need society to make one for them. And that's why human society is socially constructed. The opposite of being socially constructed for Berger, as for Galen, would be to be biologically constructed. Okay? One year later, so uh, 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 Berger writes his article in 1965. In 1966, Clifford Geertz, is he also known in? Uh, not so much. OK. Um, he, uh, he is arguably the most widely influential anthropologist of the second half of the, of the 20th century. And he published an article called The Impact of the Concept of Culture on the Concept of Man. And here, Geertz quotes Galen without uh, giving him, without citing him, which Geertz is sort of famous for, and, and, and says that human beings are an incomplete and unfinished animal if considered only physically, because again, they don't have instincts to determine their behavior. He just took over Galen's argument and agreed with it. And he said, lacking such instincts, human beings need what he called a control mechanism to shape their behavior so that it is not, to quote him again, a mere chaos of pointless acts and exploding emotions. You know, William James's famous phrase that the world for babies is a blooming, buzzing confusion. You know, he's saying, they need a control mechanism so the world isn't just chaos to them. And for Geertz, that control mechanism is the culture that a person is socialized into, which shapes their ideas, their desires, and how they act. What Geertz is arguing against here, it's important to know, is the very common idea in, in, the, uh, in the 19th century that if you just tear away a person's culture, you would discover what human nature really is, right? If you could tear, I was actually raised in the United States, if you could tear American culture off of me or Chinese culture, wherever you're from, off of you, then we'd know what human beings really are because we'd get to the real human being underneath the kind of the extra added stuff. But Geertz's point, and in the 19th century, there were all kinds of, certainly writings in English about finding people who were raised by animals, or finding people who had no culture at all, and the hope was if you studied them, you'd know were humans really loving creatures, were they really warlike creatures, were they really, you know, you could find out what true elemental humanity is like. But instead, Geert says, because we're incomplete animals in physical terms, people without culture wouldn't be, as he puts it, human beings in their natural state, but they would be unworkable monstrosities. They would be using, he uses an English idiom, they would be basket cases. Yeah, things that just couldn't function, couldn't do anything at all. They'd be sort of miserable, pathetic creatures who are completely unable to survive in the world. So for, him, for Geertz, the point is that the only way to study human beings is in relation to the cultures that make them workable or complete 
animals by defining worlds in which they can live. There is no human without culture because humans without culture wouldn't survive, wouldn't make it because they'd have no idea what the world is like, what, what they want from the world and how to get it. Okay. Now, what I want to argue is that this tradition of philosophical anthropology and its social scientific expressions is crucial to the study of values. And I think it's crucial to the study of values because a key aspect of human incompleteness is that human beings are born with no sense of what is important to them or what they should desire. As noted, they have drives, like hunger, but no determinate sense of what will satisfy those drives. Babies, at least in the US, but I'm kind of imagining, certainly in Europe too, everywhere, they'll put anything in their mouth and try to eat it, right? They are not born with a definition of what counts as food, which is why you really have to watch them all the time. They don't have a determinative, instinctive idea of what they should value to satisfy the drive of hunger, okay? And a key aspect of their openness to the world is that lots of different things could become important to them as an answer to the drive for hunger. So pigs could become very important to you, or cattle, or tree grubs, or only vegetable food. Depending on the culture you're raised in, what you will value as an answer to your hunger will differ. But without a culture, you won't have any idea what could satisfy this drive. But it's also true, this is the flip side, the corollary of this point that human beings are born not knowing what to desire, that it's also true that human beings can come to want so many different things that if they ended up wanting or valuing everything that they could want, or they wanted them all equally strongly, they would probably go crazy, right? They'd be torn in so many directions. If you thought pigs were just as important as cattle, were just as important as vegetables, or just, you know, you wouldn't know where to put your time. You wouldn't know what to focus on. You would be torn in so many directions if you valued everything that it's humanly possible to value, right? The great sociologist Emile Durkheim, who we'll talk about more next lecture, uh, defined anime Word for that in uh, in Chinese? Animation? No, A N uh, A N O M I E. Okay, um, it, it's like a state of disconnection from the world and from 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 society. It, it's a little bit like alienation, but it, it's it's uh, it's it's more broad spread. It's not caring about anything in the world. But Durkheim defined anime, in fact, as not knowing what you should desire, not knowing what you value, and not knowing what is precisely desirable or valuable in that second order kind of way that we've discussed. That's what Durkheim called anime. It's having too many desires. It's wanting so many different things that you don't know where to put your attention, you don't know where to put your energy, you, you don't know what you want. Um, I sometimes think the picture of anime is, um, you know how infants, as they get tired, they speed up? They, they get faster and they run around and they get quite desperate and they, at least American infants do this, I'm less sure of this than putting everything in their mouth, which I think babies do everywhere, but when babies are tired, rather than stopping, they go kind of crazy. And I think that's partially because they experience tiredness as a drive, but they don't know yet that just stopping and sleeping will satisfy that drive, which is why you kind of have to rock them or do something to settle them down. But anyway, if that illustration doesn't work, it's not a problem. The main point is that human beings are born with too few specific values, too few specific desires, and they're in danger of ending up with too many and that would pull their life in very different directions. And for this reason, I think a major task of all human societies is ensuring that the people who live in them end up with a, a workable, a livable set of values. Um, 
values are then in terms that Geertz never used again after his 1966 article that I quoted from and that I won't use again, but they are what Geertz there called the control mechanisms of human lives, right? Values tell human beings what to go after, what among those things they go after are more important and what are less important, and then they also tell them how to know when a person has had enough of any given thing that they should go after. Without values, none of those questions get answered. What should we desire? What should we not desire? And how much of anything we should desire do we have? So I think values keep human beings, who are these incomplete animals, from wanting both too little and too much to be able to flourish in the world. And their ability to do this is what makes values a key social scientific issue. There just isn't any successful human life on this account of human nature that doesn't have values as a critical part of the human makeup or, or what humans have. Okay? So now that I've given you at least one argument of why values are so important to human beings, I want to raise in an introductory way one more long-standing issue in both, in the, both the philosophical and the social scientific discussion of values to which social sciences have provided a distinctive answer. And, that I'm, and the social scientific answer to this question I'm going to draw on in all the lectures that follow. And this is the problem of whether values are really objectively there in the world worlds that people inhabit or are just inside of those people. Sometimes this is called the question of whether values are objective, real things in the world, or subjective, only the result of things that are inside of human beings. Okay? And it's bedeviled both the philosophical and the social scientific study of values for a very long time. It often, it, you, you can't pick up a book in social science or philosophy about values without learning about the subjectivity objectivity problem in the first chapter. It's, it's there everywhere. And it often appears as the question of whether we value things or states of affairs or kinds of actions, etc., because they are truly valuable in themselves or whether things are only valuable because individuals value them. It's kind of a humanistic version of Plato's famous Euthyphro problem, right? Does God declare something good because it is good? Or is it good because God declares it good? In the same way, are things valuable because human beings find them valuable? Or do human beings find them valuable because really, in some objective sense, they're valuable? Okay, so that kind of question is there in any studies of values. And it's even hard to exist as a human being without encountering these kind of questions in your own life. Because most people believe their own values, the things they think are important, are objectively important. They're important because of qualities that they have, not that we attribute to them. Okay, they they think, Eurotman think pigs really are the very best animals and the very best food. The newer really think cattle are the very best animals, the very best food. Where I grew up in the United States, realizing your own individual ambitions was really the most important thing you could do. That was an objective fact about the world. People are, as the psychological anthropologist Richard Schrader put it, folk moral realists. Okay, that means they think their own values are objective, really there in the world, rather than being dependent on, the subject, on subjective feelings for their ability to be desirable. Right, so they would be good. Pigs, for the Eurotman, pigs would be good even if there were no Eurotman to have the subjective experience of valuing pigs. They'd still be good. It, they, and everybody is that way, Richard Schrader says, about their own values. That they're real things in the world and not just subjective attributions to things. But even as everybody is kind of a folk moral realist, at the same time, everybody's encountered some other people, even people they like or admire, who don't 
value precisely what they themselves value, right? So I may think rock and roll music is objectively the most valuable kind of music in the world. But I have friends, and there are many other people who aren't my friends, who do not think rock and roll is the very best kind of music in the world. In fact, some of them think it has no value at all, right? But we find that all the time. It's really most easy to do this with aesthetic examples, because in aesthetics, people often come up with, I think that's extremely beautiful, and their best friend says, actually, I think that's quite ugly and has no aesthetic value. So our folk moral realism, our idea that the things we value really are valuable in themselves, and not just because we value them, we're often confronted with the fact that there are other people who don't perceive them that way and don't find that to be a part of their objective nature. Okay, so this is a, this is a key problem for anybody who studies values is how are we going to see them? Are we going to see them as objective real things in the world? Or are we going to see them as only subjective? And in fact, this topic has beset, or this question has beset the topic of values from the very beginning, as I said. And I want to try to explain why this is so. And to do that, I briefly want to discuss how scholars, and in the first place philosophers, it came upon this problematic aspect of the subjective versus the objective nature of values in the first place. And this is the last thing I'm going to do today. I should say this lecture is a little longer than the other two, so I hope I'm not taking too much of your time, but this is the last point I want to make today. Also the point I'm most nervous about, because I'm going to do a little seat of the pants anthropological history of philosophy here that I, is not very subtle. And many of you will know the history of this philosophy much better than I do. At best, I'm doing a kind of history of the common sense, educated person's understanding of the history of, of philosophy. And it's more of a genealogy than a history. I'm interested in kind of the high points when things shifted, not the slow developments. But here we go. Okay. The first thing to know is that philosophers had since ancient times had ways of talking about what we would today call values. Right? The ideas people use in judging some things to be better or more desirable than others. Ancient philosophers recognized at least three main dimensions of judgment when they said what, that we might ask of a thing, is it true? This is a question of its epistemic value, right? about the contribution something makes to our knowledge. Is it good? This is a question of ethical value. Is something morally acceptable, or does it enhance the flourishing of human life? And three, we could ask, is it beautiful? The question of aesthetic value. And these are still considered key dimensions of value. But note that it wasn't until the second half of the 19th century, the 1850s and after, that anyone thought to put all of these ways of judging things into the same bowl, as it were, and say that they all had something in common. That they were all something like species of the same genus, which they called the genus of values. Okay? Anciently, these were very separate realms. It was only in the second half of the 19th century that people thought, oh, wait, all of these things are kind of different versions of the same problem. And we'll call this the problem of values. Okay, before then, philosophers considered truth, beauty, and goodness radically different spheres of life, and that's why each one still has its own distinct field within philosophy, right? Aesthetics, epistemology, and ethics. To be sure, people worried about the relation between these three different dimensions of value, so you could ask what is the relation of the true and the good, the true and the beautiful, the beautiful and the good, et cetera, et cetera, but, they, but people until the second half of the 1800s didn't see them as different forms of the same kind of thing. Um, okay, so what happened? This is the story I want to tell. What happened that led later philosophers, after the 1850s or so, to want to put them together as members of the same genus, the genus of values? And I want to argue, and I'm, and I'm taking this from some historians of German philosophy, particularly Herbert Schnadelbach, I'm not, so I'm not making this up completely by myself. Uh, what happened is that 
after about the 1850s, the scientific materialist worldview rose to dominance. Okay. It had been developing since the Enlightenment, of course, but really the scientific materialist worldview became entrenched as the dominant Western worldview in the second half of the 19th century. And in that scientific materialist worldview, all that really exists in the world is matter and motion. Okay, prior to this, the dominant view was an Aristotelian one, that different kinds of matter had different kinds of purposes, different teleologies or goals or final causes that they were trying, as it were, to reach. And seeing how well something fit its purpose allowed you to tell whether it was good, something that fit its purpose was good, or whether it was beautiful, or even in some senses, at least in English, of the word true, whether it was true, because we will say of somebody, well, she is a true scholar, right? She has realized her purpose. Or an arrow can fly true, which means it flies straight, right? So if something realizes its purpose, then it is either beautiful, good, or true. But in the scientific materialist worldview, things don't have purposes. They just exist. They're not true or good or beautiful. They just are. If you've ever studied evolutionary biology, which my wife does professionally, she's a professor of evolutionary biology, you may remember that they spend a lot of time telling you that evolution has no goal. You know, it, it, evolution isn't leading toward realizing a specific nature of a thing or a specific purpose of a thing. Evolution has these short-term goals of sort of adapting to the environment. The environment changes, the goal of evolution changes. It's not, evolution is not a goal-driven process. And that's really part of the scientific materialist worldview, that the real world, the real material world, doesn't really have purposes in it. One of the great statements in the history of the scientific materialist worldview is banishment of, of values and purposes and goals from the world and from ethics in particular, was Hume's famous claim that you can't move from is to ought, right? Famously, you can't say that the world is x way, so you ought to do y. For Hume, this was a logical mistake because you've left out an important part of your reasoning. And the part you've left out has to do not with the way the world is, but with, with, but with what particular human beings feel or think. So you can't go from the fact that people who are sort of underwater for more than a few minutes drown and die to the claim that people who have been underwater for more than a few minutes need to be rescued. Okay? The fact that people drown in water does not require that they be rescued. Only the feeling some people have that human lives should not be lost if this can be prevented requires this rescue, right? And the fact, and that, the fact that human beings feel that other human beings shouldn't die if that can be prevented is a fact about people's feelings, not about the material world. In a material sense, it really doesn't matter if an individual human being lives or dies because they're submerged underwater. The point is then for Hume that facts themselves do not tell us what it is good to do. Okay, that's a separate realm of consideration that doesn't involve the nature of the material world, per se. Kant was deeply influenced by Hume, and, and, and you can argue he went even further to say that not only goodness, but also truth isn't part of the objective material world, but is part only of the world as humans perceive it. He has his famous argument, I don't need to tell you this here, but he has his famous argument that there's a noumenal or real world we can never know, and a phenomenal world we know only through our senses, and our senses shape that world and may distort it in presenting it to us. For Kant, as I understand it, truth is a judgment we make about the phenomenal world given to us by our senses and not about the real world of the scientific materialists. Okay, and so the good, the beautiful, and the true thus came to have one thing in common in, after the scientific materialist worldview became the dominant worldview. And that is because, they're, because all these things, the good, the beautiful, and the true, are products of human subjective evaluation, none of them are part of the real 
material world, the world as it objectively is. Thus, philosophers began to define them as belonging together. Remember I said they didn't all used to be one kind of thing, but began to define them as belonging together precisely because each of them was not something that was in the material world. After they made this move to put them all together as these aspects of evaluation that weren't given in the material world, they borrowed the word value, which in German is Wert or Worth, okay, from political ec economy, which was also just developing at this time, which defined values as, um, uh, 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 yeah, so they, did, I'm sorry, they, they borrowed the term worth or values from the political economists to name the genus values of which then they said all of these not material existing things like truth, beauty, and goodness belonged as different species. Political economists had been using the word wert, wert to describe how people evaluated market goods in relationship to one another. So a pair of shoes is worth or has the value of a pound of grain. But now philosophers used it to name all processes of evaluating anything in relation to anything else in any way, right? So it became a matter of value whether something is more beautiful than something else, whether something is more ethically good than something else, where something is rather tr more true than something else. But this grouping of values that things that belong, as things that belong together in a single genus, in part because they do not exist in the objective material world, left philosophers with the problem of where in fact values are. If they're not in the material world, where are they? And they really only had two options to offer. One was they don't really exist at all. They're a way of talking about things, but they don't exist at all. And the other, as we've already come across, is that they're only subjective. There's something that's inside each individual human being. If the human being is, somehow doesn't have them, then for them, the world doesn't have it either. In case you think that the question of whether values really exist at all or not is kind of a, a, a silly question or not, not one to take seriously, there's currently a very live philosophical debate that, that, suggests, that suggests otherwise the meta-ethical position that's known as moral error theory. Is this, this is John Mackey, who I think was Humean, um, in his book Inventing Right or Wrong, which is very, very influential in British and American um, analytic philosophy, who says that um, in point of fact, there is no such thing as values in the world because, as he puts it, values would be a queer object. There's nothing else that's in the objective world that tells us how we have to respond to it that tells a human being how they have to respond to it. That's not a quality of anything else in the world. So he says, what are the chances that there's just one thing in the world that has this quality while all other objects do not? He says the chances are not good, so there are no values. He says humans believe there are values, but in fact, they're wrong about this. And this is why it's called moral error theory, that we think, in particular for Mackey, that there are moral values that are objective that are real, but in fact were wrong. This is a very live, you can find many books about this, many debates about it. It also gave rise to a sort of successor theory called moral fictionalism that argues that there are no such thing as values in the world, but people do believe there are values and that's a really good thing. That helps societies function really well, so we can just leave it. But philosophically, we should know that that's an error. Okay, so there's, so I'm just trying to say these are, st this is, that's still one very live option. The subjective option is the more common one, that yeah, values aren't things out there in the world, but they really are powerful subjective kinds of uh, phenomenon that are important. So what I've told you so far, and this is my concluding point for today, is that philosophy invented this single category of values that included the true, the good, and the beautiful in the late uh, 19th century, uh, late 1800s, uh, late 19th century. But, but I also want to argue, and this is what I'm going to do for the rest of these lectures, it's not the only thing I'm going to do, but it, that um, philosophers may have invented this category of values, 
But social scientists save values from vanishing completely from the objective real world. Philosophers couldn't find a way to get them back in the real world once they adopted the kind of scientific materialist worldview. But I think that social scientists did find a way of getting them back into the objective real world. But they did this by redefining what it meant to exist objectively. Okay, they claim, these social scientists claim that if we understood objectivity correctly, values could be objective too. But that we were going to have to understand objectivity differently than the scientific materialists understood objectivity. Okay, I'm going to adopt that view that if we, if we take a certain special definition of objectivity, then values can be objective. And I think this is what Peter Berger and Clifford Gertz, those very influential social scientists who picked up Galen's notion of incomplete animals, also did. Okay, it's what, it's what Berger um, meant by arguing that, that institutions were objectively real and that values were part of institutions, socially constructed institutions, and what Geertz meant by saying that values are cultural and that culture was objectively real in this special sense. That, that, that institutions and culture supplied human beings with the values they needed to avoid having too few values or too many, or too few desires and too many that they faced because they were in complete animals. The key figure in redefining objectivity such that values could be objective, that they could be parts of people's shared real worlds, just in the effects of feelings inside of any given individual, was the great French sociologist and philosopher, because he really helped invent sociology, was trained as a philosopher, Emile Durkheim. And I will talk about how he did this in my next lecture and then go on to look at these other questions of how values can be organized within particular cultures and how their organization matters for people's moral experience. So that's it for today. Thanks. <laughs>